Um, you should see the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Sarah Kaiser with the MacGuffin, and we are here with Ron Perlman and Daniel Stom uh, for 13 Sins, which is South by Southwest film. And uh, I guess I'm not a big horror person. I definitely will see a minimum. So um, I kind of had some general questions. Um, for you, Daniel, um, since you wrote this based on a source material called 13 Game of Death, I mean, what drew you to wanting to kind of cover this, this story? Well, I just liked the structure a lot in that there were, by definition, 13 uh, kind of centerpieces to the movie. Normally with a movie you get to do two or three big set pieces, you know, and with this one it was so quick and it was one idea after the next and they were wildly different because the structure allowed you to do that. Yeah. It was always chapter marker, completely new idea, chapter marker, completely new idea. Uh, I thought this was a really fun kind of story to, to try a lot of things, a lot of settings, a lot of different energies. You know, one thing would be an action sequence, the next thing would be a comedy, you could switch genres, you know, one yeah. thing would be comedic, the next thing would be so dark, then you have a very character-driven scene. It just allowed you to do a lot of things within one movie that you usually can't do. Uh, let's talk about the cast. I mean, it's pretty big. Uh, <laughs> you got Mark Webber. Um, I know he said he, uh, this is his first like big starring role where he's not a supportive actor. And then you got Rutina Wesley and Pruitt Taylor Vince, who I know mostly from Tom Constantine. I love that film. Um, and then, of course, Ron as well. I mean, how did you put together this this cast? We had a great casting director, Mary Vernou, who's called, you can pronounce her name better, say it. This is good. That's Mary, Mary <laughs> Vernou. Um, who just has uh, such integrity, she doesn't care about the genre, she cares about the characters. Mm -hmm. you know? And because I'm not a huge horror guy myself... Oh, really? You know, I always have the feeling you, you make a drama no matter what genre you make, and then if it turns horrific, then it's a horror movie. If it's set in outer space, then it's a science fiction. If, you know, if it's horseback riding, it's a western. <laughs> but it's still... Why people come to see the movie is the interaction and the power play between characters. And genre movies might... might, might process the conflicts a little bit differently, a little bit more extroverted, mm -hmm. a little more other, um, but it's still the human kind of interest that drives people. Yeah. Um, and so with the characters, I was really excited to get character actors that are not genre actors, because genre actors have, uh, seem to be, I always call them toothpaste commercial actors, because they are gorgeous, but they all look the same, mm. and I can, you know, if I turn around, uh, I'll re won't recognize them anymore. Yeah. And I wanted people that have the depth of character actors. And Mark has worked with Woody Allen and with Lars von Trier and with Jim Jarmusch, with great people. Um, Rutina is a Juilliard yes. person. Prue Taylor Win Vince was in Mississippi Burning. I mean, we have. We have Mr. Pearl here, you know, <laughs> Legend in itself, um, and even down to our father character, who's one of Oliver Stone's actors and was in JFK and all that. Okay. We have people that are not genre actors, and to have them come together and bring the story to life that is a very genre film, clearly, yeah. um, I think that's probably what I'm most proud of about the whole movie, this cast. Um. For, I mean, horror fans are pretty critical of movies. So, <laughs> how do you think this one's going to set apart from maybe ones they love and ones they don't like so much? I don't know if you can, I don't know if I know enough genre movies to think about what to yeah. avoid and what to hit and all that. I think yeah. a story, you're looking for a story that has so much integrity and has such a compelling core to it that you just strive for to bring that to life. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself insane. So you think yours is unique because of this 13 different sort of mini stories? Yeah, it's hopefully unique because of the details. It's unique because of the emotions that the actors yeah. are bringing to life. You know, I don't know if we... Like a lot of movies that we're compared to now weren't out when we were making the movie, like Cheap Thrills or something like that. Yeah. Um, we hadn't seen, so there's no... With Last Exorcism, it was different because you're obviously up against this, one of the best horror movies of all time, The Exorcist. And in that case, we did watch that and analyzed it and said, let's make very sure that we don't repeat a single thing that that movie is doing because you can't improve on it. You know, people yeah. will always fault you for that. 
Um, with this movie, it was different. It was kind of more innocent, the whole thing, I think. Uh, Ron, I think the last time you were, well, I don't think you came, but um, South by Southwest, you were a transgender character. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, what drew you to this role? I mean... Well, the fact that I uh, wasn't a transgender. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, it shows that you're willing to take risks. I just wanted risks. to show yeah. Texas my versatility. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, you are willing to take risks with your characters. I mean, I people know now you mostly from, of course, that wonderful show you're in. Um, but, I mean, why this role specifically? Well, it was basically, how do I, <clears throat> how do I get in this movie? Okay. Um, um, we, were, we were originally discussing a different role for me. And um, my sense was that... Um, there was probably another actor that was more right for that role than I would be. Mm -hmm. And then if I <clears throat> tackled that role, I'd be kind of giving a performance rather than seamlessly fitting in. Yeah. And I thought it was essential for everybody in this movie in order to, to, to uh, set the rules of engagement that it didn't look like anybody was giving a performance. Mm -hmm. It looked like everybody was, you know, um, who they were supposed to be. And then we came up with the idea of the character that I finally played. Ultimately, it was really just important for me to be in this movie because I was such a fan of the script. And okay. The script, the script was uh, startlingly, uh, brilliantly executed um, and really, really original. It kept me, it was a page turner. Yeah. And all the way to the end, it never disappointed me. And um, um, I sat down with Daniel um, the enthusiasm sort of um, evolved and the fact that we were able to find a character that, that both of us felt was uh, uh, going to honor the storytelling yeah. was, uh, was really phenomenal because it allowed me yeah. to, uh, to work with this <laughs> young, young genius. Um, Daniel, you were also here in 2008 for A Necessary Death at South By, so this isn't your first time here either. Well, and it was my first film festival ever. It was my oh, first, wow. bringing my first movie yeah. ever to my first festival ever, so South by Southwest is in my blood now. <laughs> What's it like, I mean, you've done The Last Exorcism, which probably brought you a little more up into the forefront of people's minds, but as far as navigating through the studio system, getting your screenplay written, um, you know, and getting it actually made. I mean, what has the, has it changed for you since the last exorcism? I mean, was it easier for you to get things done? Well, you get a lot of meetings. You get a lot of people calling and sending you their material. So you have bigger access to a lot of scripts. Um, it's still hard on my level to find a really great script. So it's, it's, it's important to me that I collaborate with a producer who says, do with it whatever you want, you know, rewrite it whatever, however you want. I'm just looking for the spark in something where I go like, oh, that is unique, that is really interesting, let's develop something mm -hmm. out of that. Because I think you will never find the 100% the script that you go like, it's brilliant, let's not touch it, let's yeah. go from there. And they, for this movie, let me bring on David Burke, who's the co-writer and who was rewriting The Last Exorcism, we were doing that together. Um, so it's different in that you build a family of people, it's the same cinematographer that I've been working with for three movies now, same editor, same writer, that you know more and more what you're doing and how you're collaborating and what you're interested in. In the beginning it's very experimental, you try to figure stuff out and then yeah. in the end you lose less and less time with experimentation. What's your take on gore? Do you like a lot, a little? I think it's the same as people always ask, what genre do you want to do? And I always said I don't have a genre, genre. Do, you know, whatever yeah. the story demands. Yeah. I think the same for gore. There's always the discussion, is it an aesthetic thing? I don't find gore itself appealing. It has to have a function in the story. I think in 13 Sins specifically, we wanted to go from a much lighter tone to a real horrific darkness, mm -hmm. where the gore isn't fun, you know? Yeah. The gore is a horrific thing, um, so you have to portray it that way and you probably like with the hand cutting off scene in 13 cents I think there, there were, would have been three ways to do it there would have been the way that you almost see nothing and you just hear it and it would have been horrific or you do a short version of it which would have been very naturalistic or then there is the over the top version that we in the end went with and we always said we have to shoot the over the top version so that we can cut it down 
to whichever version the film demands in the editing room. And the hand cutting off scene was, to me, was so horrific in these iterations that were more real, mm -hmm. more realistic, that we said, let's go over the top, let's make this ridiculous, let's you know, have this go on forever that people go like, oh my god. Um, Fantastic sequence. <laughs> just, just Fantastic something. sequence. And I, 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 I laughed. Right. And um, if it had been, it was a real, it was a real genuine laugh. I remember, uh, you know, Friday night was the first time I saw the film. Okay. So I'm fresh in, yeah. in having a reaction. But yeah, you did it. You, you accomplished exactly that. It was just good. And it was set up in such a way so that right up to the deed, you didn't know whether it was going to be. Um, uh, what it was going to end up being in terms yeah. of, and so by by making the choice of, of making it um, um, a little over the top, as you say, um, it became uh, a real theatrical choice that 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 um, took the audience to even another place where they they were they were guaranteed that they would never be able to figure out yeah. what was coming next. Go ahead. No, that's no. <laughs> um, I, I guess I, I liked it because the main character, even though he was doing all these horrible things, he was a good guy. Right. And he's a little flawed, but you, it, it showed, you know, what someone can do for money, what someone will do for their family, and things like that. So I thought it was interesting. Um, Ron, how does it, this experience working with... Uh, Daniel, differ from your experience on Drive with Revan? Because um, he's a big fan of violence and all that, so I wondered how the how. Well, the, you know, the, the 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 similarity is that they seem to both be obsessed with remaining iconoclasts and remaining um, mavericks and remaining somewhat outside the system, mm -hmm. so that they can have the freedom to to um, show their, their color palette in, in an expansive way that, that is not yeah. um, um, feeding into someone else's agenda. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is where filmmaking needs to live. So uh, I seek out, as much as possible, being in the company of, 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 of people like that. Um, and, you know, uh, Refn made his movie. Daniel made his movie to the degree that they could. Yeah. Um, and part of the the genius of what they have to do in order to do that is because it's a balancing act. Because you're taking money from someone to make a movie, so that person has a fiduciary set of uh, concerns, mm -hmm. and you have to constantly be um, uh, uh, mollifying their concerns by saying, no, 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 this is going to end up being very yeah. commercial, but you also want to make your film and make it in, in, in an unwatered down way as possible. And uh, to me, that's the phenomenal balancing act of working in independent cinema yeah. and worrying about where the film ends up as kind of a crapshoot, because yeah. that's exciting. It's like, you know, some I've been involved in movies that no one has ever seen. And they were good movies. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in really shitty ones that everyone has seen. So somewhere in the middle there is, is like the, the solution. Yeah. And the, 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 my, my particular um, obsession is to be in as much of a, 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 um, an environment that allows for just originality and creativity as possible, and then everything else will worry about itself. Um, just to kind of wrap up, uh, I mean, what's is this film being released? Is it already been picked up? Uh, yeah, it's a dimension release. It's going to come out on premium VOD in a week from now, okay. March 14th, and then theatrically April 18th. Okay, so you're pretty happy. It's all set and yes. done, yes. and go for it. <laughs> Um, if I could just ask what your opinion is on the video on demand sort of see it's hard because I think I grew up with theatrical movies and so that is always kind of the goal but yeah. then things are changing so much and I understand that 
um, that that TVs in people's homes are getting bigger. People are just watching. You know, the TV is different. There is high quality TV now that people yeah. are watching. So I understand that things are changing. I still have to convince myself that that's okay to happen to my movies because I yeah. kind of, of course, you shoot them for people to see them on a screen as big as possible. You mix them for a theatrical mix. You know. Um, so I think any filmmaker that says they prefer the VOD model is probably kidding themselves or other people. Um, but things are changing and, and it's just like people aren't shooting movies on film anymore. Ten years yes. ago everyone said, you know, that's where the real art lies on film and now no one can tell the difference. I think we are in a time of change with that stuff and we'll just have to go with it. It's just that we are on the brink of it right now, so it still feels a little bit unnatural. Yeah. You know, and there can be as many margin calls and, and movies like that that really make the model happen. It still feels a little bit like a letter to you. Yes. That's where I am right now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for sitting thank down you. with me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.